as the chairperson of the uh, panel, uh, welcome today to session one of the uh, symposium. And this is going to be on art as communication. So really um, interesting combination of papers here. I think we've got a lot of interesting places for uh, interconnections, interdisciplinary connections between different uh, forms of representation and different fields of study. So man, I'm really excited about this and uh, it's a great place to have it because uh, we've got this amazing collection of woodblock prints here too. So I'm really excited and want to get started now. So this is Jordan Michaels. So hello everyone again. If you came a few minutes early, I apologize for the <laughs> connection issues. Um, but in the old tradition, what is a last presentation without a few technical uh, differences? So can everybody see the screen? Are we all good here? Can I get a heads up? Okay, cool. And then you don't really need to see me. Just listen to the voice. <laughs> um, so. Hello everyone again, and thank you so much for coming out today. Um, as Dr. Seen mentioned, my name is Jordan Michaels, and I'm a current senior here at Oglethorpe. Um, my concentration of study is a little different than a typical student. I'm doing IPM, so I'm mainly focusing on East Asian studies. Um, because I'm working on an individually planned major, um, my focus is in some ways a little more specific, and in other ways, much more broad than other majors. Um, and I think it's a really awesome way of repping for the liberal arts aspect of Oglethorpe because it allows students like myself uh, to talk about topics that are never really brought up in the gen ed courses um, at other schools. Um, so that said, throughout my portion of the panel, we're gonna be discussing pilgrimage culture and how the process of trekking thousands and thousands of miles through forest um, and plain and desert has over time managed to preserve some of the most beautiful world sites. Um, so this by means of any course isn't entirely because of the physical process of taking step-by-step -step journeys through wilderness, um, but is rather in many cases, such as with Mecca, Machu Picchu, or Vatican City, um, it's a significant cultural bond between pilgrim and geographic place, um, one that's so strong that it in many cases transcends generations language, and at times, even religion. Um, before we get into any of that, um, let's define a few things. If I can change the first slide. All right, so reaching out to the audience here, can anybody tell me what a pilgrimage is? I see shaking heads. Do you guys not know what a pilgrimage is? <laughs> there you go. I'm, I don't actually know. I'm going to guess, though. Okay. Yeah, I'm, here to, I'm here to learn from you, Jordan. Um, a pilgrimage, maybe it's a a journey with the intention of transformation of yourself or others. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Anybody else want to add on that? Yes. Um, in my cultural experience, it's typically religious. In or there's a religious or spiritual connotation associated with a pilgrimage. That, that's honestly, as someone who went through like the K through 12 system, and that's all we hear about is like it's a religious pilgrimage. <laughs> that is kind of what I thought before getting into this topic that a pilgrimage is exclusively for the religious, exclusively for the dedicated, and something that you really have to be a part of a minority to, like a religious minority to participate with. Um, but surprise, surprise, my view has actually changed. So hopefully the presentation will really explain why. Um, so next question is, what is a pilgrim? And I guess, Ms. Peterson, you already kind of answered some of that. The transformation of the self. Uh, obviously, people go on these journeys not to do their daily activities, but to see something different, possibly self-changing in nature. So, surprise, I'm not actually going to give you the definition of pilgrim. Instead, I'm going to give you this lovely symbol up here. So, I know a lot of you, probably most of you, don't understand Japanese, so I'm going to break it down for you. So this is how you would refer to pilgrim in Japanese. Um, you read it as henro, H-E-N-R-O. Um, it also simultaneously refers to pilgrim. So the journey and the journey, the traveler, are one and the same. Um, the symbols actually mean, so these two characters, they're called kanji. Um, the first one is read as hen, the second is ro. Hen actually means everywhere, a broad general space. And row, the second one, means road. 
So from this, we can actually gather that in the most general sense, a pilgrimage is the journey of the self, with the world available in any order you choose. Um, so question I want to pose to you all is, where will you go? And more importantly, what is the meaning you're going to hold behind it? So, does this ring any bells to anyone? This is the Hajj, or a, a image of the Hajj. Um, so the most famous of pilgrimages, um, at least in my gen education, has been the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, it's made once in a lifetime, sometimes more, um, by fortunate individuals to go to this holy city. Um, it's actually fulfilling one of the five essential pillars of Islam. Um, however, despite the utter importance of this sacred site, attacks have been made against it, some recently, in an attempt to tear down the sacred buildings and monuments. Um, so this phenomenon is not alone in the Muslim world. It has happened to Christians, it has happened to Jews, it has happened to Buddhists, um, and many, many other religious sites throughout the Western world. Um, I doubt anyone in this room has yet to hear about the recent attacks in Syria, specifically made to churches on Palm Sunday. Um, and without diving too deeply into the loss of human life, because that isn't the focus of this presentation, um, for historians and cultural anthropologists watching, and for generations to follow, the thing that will be mourned, and the thing that will be identified with these attacks, is the loss of a society, of art, and most notably for this area, of religious and cultural centers. These, in other words, are the foundations for pilgrimage and cross-geographic geographical interaction. Um, so what we have left of these sites, and, and with very little of it, is art. Sculptures, as you can see here, architecture, most of which is destroyed, printed works, and more, recent, more recently, photography. So moving on to the focus of my presentation, um, one nation that has done a uniquely successful job at preserving their cultural history in relation to pilgrimage is Japan. Um, now Japan is very lucky. It is an island. It is not thrown into the clash of ge geographical or resource wars. Um, so in many cases, it is an extremely special case. Um, so if you look here, you'll see a traditional woodblock print. And to the far left, um, you'll see a photograph looking oddly similar. Um, so these are uh, images of a bridge that is at the end of a pilgrimage leading to Kyoto, one of the main cultural hubs um, in Western Japan. Um, similar to the United States and to Europe, um, Japan has developed at a very rapid pace over the past hundred years or so. Um, it sacrificed land for factories, farms, and just the general capitalist agenda. But despite years of relentless industrialization, the mass migration from country and suburb to capital um, the terror of war and all of that stuff that comes with the lovely 1800s. Um, pilgrimage has remained a constant in Japan for the past millennium. Um, the reason behind this um, is similar to any popular pil pilgrimage route. Um, at the end lays satisfaction, often religious or economic or spiritual in nature. Um, and Japan is no different. So the idea of travel culture actually predates the development of Japan's modern capitals um, for the very reason that it gave birth to them. Um, in many cases, the path upon which Henro or the pilgrims trek, um, they actually mark early trade routes. Um, the landmarks along them represent posts or places of rest necessary for both ancient traders and the modern pilgrim. So at times, these sites were known as these cities, Edo, Miyako, and Nani, it cut off the A, I'm sorry, it's Naniwa, not Nani, Nani. <laughs> um, but we know them today by different names. Um, this is a similarity you'll find across many ancient pilgrimage, pilgrimages all across the world, and is the actual foundation for these groups. Um, it's sometimes seemingly spiritual in nature, but it actually marks the early movement of hunters, gatherers, then tribes, um, either moving alongside cattle or in search of a place to settle. Um, this is most obvious in areas like the Middle East where we have sacred holy sites like Jerusalem and areas in the plain that now are huge mega centers, but in early points were just places where the water was good, there was access to farming and such on and so forth. Um, Japan is actually no different. 
Um, um, retracing one's steps, or those of one's elders, um, is a tradition that's held close at many ancient cultural centers, um, or cultures, and it has been interpreted today as the pilgrimage. While it may be easy now to see the connection between this, this map, it's important to remember that the sense of place, just the sense of where we are geographically in the world, was not a thing back then. Um, the sense of where we're going, where we're headed, we couldn't look at it in this way. So maps were really a modern luxury, and tools other than the night stars developed separately depending on the area. Um, so it's really important to remember that pilgrimages, we marked our way kind of by what we knew, kind of by what, who we knew, where they were going, and where we would follow. Um, which when you think about it, is really mind-blowing, considering that I got to school today using a GPS, <laughs> because the highway was back. <laughs> so um, how, how can we even begin to fathom how amazing it is you know, these people going right, it's just, it blows my mind. <laughs> I won't spend too much time on that. <laughs> so, as an island, you may think Japan held an oddly specific navigation system of some sort, at least for its early history. Um, but to many people's surprise, travel began, travel between the regions was not always popular. Um, those somewhat familiar with Japanese history may recall a complete travel ban um, during the samurai rule. Uh, thankfully, no nation is complete without trade, and over time, the demand for certain resources, such as rice and paper, helped carve out moderately safe pathways upon which traders could meet and exchange. Um, but for the most part, traveling from north to south to east to west, it wasn't as encouraged as it was here in the United States, where we were all just pushing west. Um, many local legends, however, exist to explain certain points along these routes, telling of forest spirits or town deities that protected original travelers that found such roads. So, in truth, these roads were equally man-made by traders as they are blessed by gods. Um, so, leading up to the Edo period, this is the early 16th century to 1868, I believe, um, there became many reasons to traverse these routes. Um, the previous cultural center of Kyoto, as you can see there in the middle of Japan, um, gave rise to early play culture, to poetry. So, five minutes till the end. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna now proceed to speed read. <laughs> so, um, Kyoto gave rise to calligraphy, um, the first novel ever produced. Osaka, on the other hand, became the powerhouse of rice production and endearingly referred to as the nation's kitchen for its mass number of food merchants. Um, Tokyo, as we know, is um, the, today's political and cultural capital, but prior to the Edo period, the capital city was still Kyoto. Hence, the shift from west to east triggered the need for a safe and secure means by which to transfer the system of power across the main island of Honshu, which is the, if you look at Japan, kind of like a banana, it's the main part of the banana. <laughs> <laughs> so, Enough to many at the time, travel had become a less popular pastime leading into the 19th century. Such ancient trade routes led in part to the development of a network of very well-built, fairly safe roads that merchants, travelers, and migrants alike were permitted to use. Um, along these routes, of course, were dots of red gates, signaling the heavy influence on trade by a traditional Shinto religion. Um, for those of you who know those, those red gates that they put in front of sushi restaurants, and for some reason they think it has to do with sushi. Um, so the traditional religion actually refused to yield and remained a solid aspect of Japanese culture. There's one right there, though it isn't red. Um, so travelers were given the opportunity to experience cultural specialties, including um, entertainment, seasonal happenings of various regions. Um, this interest in travel as a leisure activity and the commercialization of local culture um, provided a plug for the centers during uh, the Tokugawa area, again, lords of Kyoto and Osaka, and it would be reflected vividly in the woodwalk prints of the time. Um, so as you don't know, these are ukiyo-e prints. This is the style of woodwalk prints I'm showing you. Um, and these prints, particularly a series by um, Utagawa Hiroshige and Utagawa um, Kiniyasu, not only preserved the physical memory of various sites in Japan, but were also made to capture the essence and joys of travel itself. Um, you may have noticed by now, I tend to steer away from photography in my slides, and this is actually because the lack of photos was made up by the art that you're seeing here. Um, but also because the art is a token of travel, um, or souvenir for those who traveled along the route later known as the Tokaido Road. 
Um, so I'm sure many of you have purchased souvenirs before, a ticket, a t-shirt, a keychain, or maybe a bumper sticker. Um, but should you have road tripped across this 19th century route, your purchase of choice would have been a copy of a print. Um, but before we get too far into that, I'm going to just take a quick moment to talk about the Tokaido. Um, this road is actually really special to me because I happened to live here when I was studying abroad in Japan. Um, but before I knew it as home, um, I knew it as the Eastern Sea Road. Um, it's one of the five major routes connecting the eastern capital of Edo, or Old Tokyo, to the western capital of Kyoto. Um, today, points along this route are used similar to how it was prior into the 1900s. Trucks and vans carry rice and paper products across highways, constructed over previous trade points. Um, I myself use this rail system to pass by the lower coastline area between the two points of Tok Tokyo and Yokohama. Um, how we know what made up these ancient routes, however, is what, a, is, what is of interest here. Um, getting from point A to point B these days can take a matter of hours by train. Um, but understanding that the walk it took our forefathers to journey from capital to capital um, is made possible um, not by the modern convenience of paved roads and bridges, but by the art created by those who chose to journey alongside these routes. Um, so most people um, knee deep into Japanese culture will be familiar with the poems of Matsuo Basho, likewise, the great waves of Kanagawa, pretty much anyone can recognize these. Um, but little do people know that these works of art are actually part of a series of views of sight along these roads. Travelers of the Tokaido journey for various reasons, trade, tourism, migration, and most popularly, pilgrimage. Along these pilgrimages were artists, um, and during their active years, um, they would produce series, some of which are known as the 53 or 49 stations of the different views of the area. Um, authentic cultural elements within these prints, coupled with near exact um, typographic renderings um, of famous trade stations, caught the attention of artists here or in Japan and abroad, um, and now for historians for the past 180 so years. Um, Hiroshige, and like I mentioned before, was not alone. Um, Matsuo Basho is famed for his travel literature written, written during this era in a similar manner, um, his journeys to Mount Fuji, Ueno, and Kyoto in later years. Um, and although their mediums varied, the styles and themes that we study today were born along this route and remain a very important factor for students today. Um, but what is even more amazing is how these art forms helped preserve these pilgrim routes that were one, that, during the travel ban. Um, strict travel restrictions were placed early on barring women and low caste citizens, but later anyone who was not part of the military were prohibited from traveling between city to city. Um, to trek just across the main island became unfathomable for many, and the Prince of Hiroshige and other artists such as Kuniyoshi and Kunisada became the only memory of previous travel destinations. Um, reproductions of these served as a memento for those who made the journey to sea. Um, and who couldn't see the many corners of Edo, Japan, and serve as a substitute memory for those who would never be able to make the trek. Um, sorry, I'm probably the only one. I'm going to try to summarize as quickly as I can. Um, in combining city imagery with the, era, with the era of traditional Japanese aesthetic, popular images took the place aside the also developing souvenir culture. Um, the accuracy of woodblock prints produced during this time may be the pride of artists, but without it, it's quite possible that the sentiment behind these prints would have remained the same. Stations such as Kanagawa and this one, Nihonbashi, which is the main bridge you see when you come into Japan, um, would hold world famous imagery today, um, paralleled, paralleled by the Siamese art pieces. Um, comparatively, though, stations along these routes, many don't exist, and some were actually rendered unsafe for travel during the radioactive chemical spill in 2011. Um, but these places are still remembered, even if just through the eye of artists. Um, so the first step by a pilgrim, pilgrim is always made with intention. Um, for many, introduce, or, sorry, <laughs> for many introducing um, the American narrative, including the American narrative, um, faith is both a limited reason and the end goal for a journey. Um, today's pilgrim may trek across the country following a band or wanting to go to a certain level of museums. Um, or they may down themselves in white, go halfway across the world to circle the Kaaba. Um, but in Japan, the choice to trek between two rapidly modernizing, modernizing cities is not only borderline crazy, <laughs> but a living dedication to the traders, artists, and perhaps even the deities that helped connect these two sides of the country.
Uh, so all in all, we owe it to art, specifically woodblock prints, for facilitating the preservation of these various groups across Japan. The most obvious being the Tokaido, but if you were to look at other clothing ranges today, you would be surprised that, we're, that clothing culture is still very much alive. Um, so today's Penrose look a little bit like this. Um, so for those that prefer a more traditional pilgrimage, going on like Tokaido might not be the best. It's filled with highways and waterways and bridges that are now used purely for transport. Um, but the Shikoku Henro, which actually tracks an island right under the main island of Honshu, um, is a Buddhist prayer route that is used now in place for those traveling with the same intention of the Tokaido early on. Um, they, travelers of the Shikoku Henro suffered the same travel bans that those did during the Edo period um, along the Tokaido. So for this reason, the modern revival of pilgrim travel has concentrated on reviving religious areas and religious routes, um, preferred over ancient trade and mythical Shinto routes that were lost to time and industrialization. So this is what a map of that looked like that we want to provide one of the Tokaido and not of the Shikoku. As you can see, it traverses the whole island, so we would go all the way around to complete it. Um, this is traveled by Buddhists, secular tourists, and even Christian pilgrims in the same manner one would have the Tokaido hundreds of years ago. Um, it's undeniably Buddhist in practice. People carry prayer beads and stop outside temples for rest. But relooking the sentiment behind pilgrims from the highly industrialized centers of Kyoto and Tokyo to a neighboring island, it's able to carry that same sentiment for religious and non-religious peoples. Um, it parallels the Tokaido station art with temples and shrines and greets pilgrims at every stop, just as you would be with your passport along the Tokaido. So I'm going to skip a few sections just for the sake of time. Um, but in closing, uh, Japan has uniquely preserved both kinds of pilgrim routes for very different reasons, be they business, trade, or out of respect for Buddhist and Shinto tradition. To better understand the beauty of pilgrimage, specifically Japanese pilgrimage, it requires us to look at the reasons behind journeying, journeying perhaps on a larger scale. Uh, since the very beginning, journeying has led to these routes. They've led to artistic renderings, they've led to maps, they've led to points of interest, and those have led to capital cities. Uh, within these cities, there's art, there's music, and that, sorry, are we good? Um, can I cut it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'll, I'll skip here. <laughs> um, so, in closing, um, I didn't really want to leave you all without a reason to go and experience one of these pilgrimages for yourself. But a ticket to Japan is probably out of question. Um, needless to say, walking hundreds and hundreds of miles per day is also a little out of question. Um, but as someone who has fallen head over heels in love with these journeys over the past few years, I didn't want to leave you without experiencing the Tokaido for yourself. Um, so following this panel, I hope you'll have a chance to look around the room that you're currently sitting sitting in, as it is a reproduction of the 53 stations of the Tokaido Road, complementary of the Old Road Museum. Um, so thank you for hearing my uh, a bit shortened presentation. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of our panelists, and best of luck to them. Thank you very much. We're going to move to the magazine world, the fashion world. Adi, uh, Adi is going to speak to us about uh, Vogue and fashion magazine, fashion magazines and Vogue's hegemony. Thank you. Rabbi Dr. Sarkos was here today. So the, the, the paper I wrote was um, about Vogue and um, its hegemony over fashion communication. So uh, if you're not familiar with Vogue, as I'm sure everybody is, uh, here's a few uh, cover issues of Vogue that I put on here, and they look very, you know, visually pleasing. <laughs> so, uh, 
So just an overview of what I will be talking about. I want to sort of go over the motivation of you know why I picked this topic. And after that, I will go ahead and present the thesis of you know what my paper was about. And once I've done that, I will go through the literature review that I um, did for the paper and sort of how I arrived at the thesis. And we'll just revisit the thesis just for a second. And then we'll also talk about the implications of you know what I found and um, you know why it should be something that we should think about. So um, as far as moderation, um, since August of um, last year, so since um, my senior year here, uh, I, I'm an intern at Atlanta Magazine. I work as an editorial assistant there. Uh, and the internship there is very, um, everybody is very supportive and you get to be part of every meeting the, the magazine sort of has. And something you always hear about is how do we improve sales? So, you know, how can we bring in more ad revenue? You know, are uh, distributions in trouble? Everything you hear about is trying to keep uh, the keep the sales alive, keep everything um, you know running and everything going smooth. So that and the class I took, um, you know, media culture and society, I started thinking about the magazine world in general, and I sort of noticed how you know there's nothing wrong with Vogue so far, you know, it's still the, the leader in the magazine world, the opinions, the, um, the judgment and everything of the top officials of Vogue, it's valued very much and it has so much power in the fashion world. So I wanted to know why Vogue maintained that status, you know, how does Vogue has the hegemony over this world and it's been, you know, they've been maintaining it. And um, looking at different markets, Vogue sort of continues this um, in domestic and international ma uh, markets, and they're pretty much unparalleled in the magazine world. So I did, did the research, and I write on the thesis of um, you know this hegemony. So what I found out was that uh, Vogue's hegemony, of course, was built over time, and uh, the stability of that that dominance is through uh, this specialization in um, communication that they found and they established. Um, it started off with just hiring fashion industry professionals to work at the magazine, and, uh, but by doing so, Vogue ended up creating this intermediary position between the, fa the high fashion world and the audience. And that was a position that wasn't there before, but Vogue ended up creating it. And by creating it, they sort of established themselves um, as this strategic necessity that the fashion world needed in order to survive, and this necessity the audience needed in order to know what real fashion was or what real high fashion was. So by creating that special role, they moved on from, oh, we're just commenting on fashion into this decision-making role like, you know, we know fashion and this is what it is and we're going to dictate what each entity should do in order to participate in that high fashion culture. So the literature review for this paper was done using the circuit of culture model. So it looked at three, uh, well, three of the five different aspects that were there. And I looked at production, text, and audience, and how they all uh, play an integral role in the creation and maintenance of this hegemony. Um, as far as production, the, the real change in um, you know, moving on from just a regular magazine into a fashion magazine happened when Vogue was introduced in Britain, and it was the late 1800s to 19, um, the, uh, to the mid-1900s when um, that introduction happened. When it was introduced, it wasn't noticed by a lot of people because it was just a lifestyle magazine. It was more of a class magazine. They were going to comment on the, the socialites, the social elites, and what they did. Um, but it wasn't really picking up in the British markets, so um, Vogue decided we're going to uh, you know, reframe our magazine into a fashion magazine, and we're going to comment on fashion. So they started doing that by, the first they started hiring, um, you know, sort of veterans of the fashion industry. People that worked at fashion houses because, you know, as this was in Britain, it was close to the European fashion market. So um, they started hiring professionals that uh, had retired or were still, or still had strong ties in the fashion world. Uh, once that was done, 
uh, Vogue Saturday did this closer look into the fashion world, and uh, rather than just commenting on, uh, you know, this is what we think fashion is, they started to get this insider look on, you know, what are what are the new trends or what are what is going to be popular in the next season because they had they started establishing these ties um, with the fashion industry. And by doing so, um, they created this intermediary position, which was between the audience and the, the high fashion houses. And um, they, just, um, they were able to fill this void of communication that wasn't there between these high fashion houses who weren't um, necessarily interested in advertising their products because you know it came with a, a specific um, class and it came with a, a special elegance of its own. Um, so, and in that fashion space, or in that communication space that we created, um, over time, the decision makers that were that, that are part of Vogue and that are also part of the fashion industry, they sort of made their own creative space, and um, it evolved into a point where every high fashion decision is made in that one space, and whoever the, that's the players in, in that you know, in that creative circle are the people that call the shots. So um, looking at the introduction to Britain, I sort of wanted to see how this model was still relevant or how this model um, was kept alive. So in 2009 was the first time when Vogue um, came into the Chinese market. And um, immediately after um, going into China, what they did was they hired people that were, hired fashion designers that were native to China and was creating Chinese fashion and uh, brought them on board and started featuring their um, collection. By 2009, of course, Vogue was, you know, Vogue was in no need for like, you know, fame or recognition because it was a brand of its own. So um, the Chinese fashion designers, they were definitely interested in the exposure, but at the same time, Vogue again established this internal communication with Chinese fashion industry where they were saying, we are telling you what is inside China's fashion industry, and we are telling you this is the high fashion in China. So it's our model, so follow this if you want to participate in that high fashion culture. Moving on to the text that I looked at. Um, for fashion magazines, text serve, the, just the content in the fashion magazine serves a really interesting purpose as in it completes the fashion communication. Because just seeing the photos of the dresses or just seeing um, you know, the products that are out there doesn't necessarily create value for that product, but it's how those uh, products are being conveyed to the audience, which is done through the content in this, uh, these fashion magazines. That's what um, lets the audience know, oh, this is the, this is the, um, you know, the standard that we're going for, or this is what, what is being considered high fashion. So the only way that part is being communicated is through the actual text that's being used. So um, high fashion or you know, what should be uh, considered uh, the, the most exclusive trends, Vogue uh, by, you know, through their content sort of defines this is the standard for, you know, for something to be considered high fashion. And moving on to audience. Um, audience uh, communicate in the fashion world, sort of, and there are like two theories that um, you know sort of describe how audience communication happens. One is a trickle down theory, which means that uh, the fashion houses or the creative directors of the fashion world sort of uh, makes the decisions, and then through production, you know, and their products go out into the market, and audience sort of picks up on, oh, this is this is what the new trends are. This is what I should be buying. The other theory is that um, there is a trickle up theory. So the audience um, have their own ideas of what they want to see in the market. And uh, if it is communicated somehow to the fashion houses, then um, they will create products that will fit those needs and uh, you know, it'll be the next trend or the new trend in the market. So um, like I said, Vogue's position in this intermediary role was new and it was something that they established. By doing so, what they did was they were able to control both of those communication. So if they were able to tell the, the fashion producers that this is, what, this is what we know the audience wants, so this is what you should be creating. 
at the same time, when the fashion producers came up with something new, they were able to communicate to the audience and say, this is what high fashion world is doing, so this is what you should be buying if you wanted to participate in this culture. So after going through all of that, just going back to the thesis. So like I said, the hegemony that Vogue has, it, it's built over time. It didn't happen overnight. And um, it happened um, you know, because there was that void back in the day. And uh, the way it is stabilized and the way it continues to exist is um, through this speciality in communication that Vogue has. So this intermediary position, and later a lot of other magazines came in to fill, fill in that same role as well. But that first, um, you know, the first advantage is that Vogue got as the original fashion communicators that remained and that continues to um, strengthen their brand and sort of make sure that um, any fashion decision is, you know, Vogue approved or somebody uh, from, you know, somebody like Anna Winter is um, making that decision or, you know, once, once it's approved by her, it, it will be a success. So um, in that intermediary position, the two things I want to uh, focus or I want to you know emphasize is uh, the control of communication that Vogue possesses and uh, the creative space it created uh, for the fashion decision makers. Because um, for the first time, once Vogue established the space, it was this common ground where they could bring in pretty much world fashion and then decide or and then have them communicate with each other and also bring in this audience aspect and say, let's create something that's going to speak to this world or, you know, this is what the world is saying, how are you going to respond to it? So a few, you know, implications of this, um, you know, that, that's related to the rest of the topics that we discussed in class. So one of the main things I want to discuss is the incorporation effect. So, and it uh, speaks directly to this, the trickle up theory that I was talking about, where the audience, uh, or the audience perceptions are conveyed to the fashion industry by, uh, by Vogue. So basically, incorporation effect is an important part of maintaining um, the hegemony of any, um, you know, media communication entity. What it says is that, um, so when there is a, let's say there is this uh, beauty YouTuber that's gaining a lot of attention, she is trending a lot. So suddenly Vogue comes in and, um, you know, and be, they will be like, would you like to write an article for us? Or would you like to start a column or, you know, be on like Vogue Snapchat story or something? Um, and suddenly, you know, there is this aspect that, yes, Vogue is diversifying, Vogue is bringing in more voices, and there is you know, more diversity in uh, the information that we're getting. But at the same time, Vogue is injecting itself into the, the way the communication is being done and controlling the communication from their own. So they're pretty much saying, okay, we recognize that you have talent or you, you have what it takes to be in the fashion world. Um, so now we are going to take over this communication power from you and we're going to dictate how this communication will be done. So at the end of the day, that, diver that diversity in communication still becomes a subsidiary of Vogue. And um, at the end of the day, they can always say, uh, yes, we recognize this uh, new talent, but it is still Vogue standards that's being applied and the Vogue standard is what that will matter. And this sort of brings me, um, goes into the second point of the entry barrier. Because of this, um, you know, close-knit communication, um, you know, process that Vogue has, it's hard for any uh, new fashion magazine to come into this market and uh, suddenly get, you know, exclusives with the, with the top executives at Chanel or, you know, uh, Prada or something because they just wouldn't want to talk to them. Um, mainly because they already have this established way of communication with Vogue, and Vogue has its own um, reputation to say that um, it's only high fashion till we approve it. So it doesn't matter if a new, new, you know, newcomer magazine features high fashion, like it's not, it's not yet there till, you know, Anna Winter says so, or somebody else at Vogue says so. Um, and on the other hand, you know, this creating an entry barrier there, on the other hand, this also 
um, sort of limits what the audience are getting. Every piece of fashion communication that goes out, if it needs to be validated by Vogue, that's only you know, that's only a few voices that are being heard at that point. There are so many designers, there, there might be so many other products that are out there that might be more affordable to a larger um, number of audience, but because it doesn't have the Vogue approval, it also doesn't have the exposure that comes uh, from Vogue. So as audience, we um, get a limited number of what we get to think of as um, you know, high fashion, or as uh, oh, this is this would um, you know make me look um, look more um, you know classy or elegant because you know because it was never approved by Vogue. So um, that's pretty much the um, you know the gist of my paper. So um, I hope it wasn't a lot of information, and it's uh, you know it's different from the pilgrimage. <laughs> but <laughs> but yes, that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Yasmin is going to be talking <coughs> about a particular story by Flaubert called A Simple Heart. Thank you. why I thought when I heard the word panel, I would be like a literal panel where I sit down. So <laughs> forgive me if this is not as structured as I, as it is, you know, it should be. Um, but yes, I, I, um, I, I wrote a paper last semester in Dr. Navarre's Global Lit class um, about uh, Gustave Flaubert's short story called A Simple Heart. Um, and it kind of details the story of a, a maid servant in 19th century France. And it kind of, you know, it depicts her life and, and kind of the, the struggles that she experiences um, at the hands of her superiors and her, not owners, but owners, kind of, they own her life. Um, and so something that really struck me um, while writing this paper was, you know, the power of words and, and how they affect us and how they can communicate different things. And, and I know writing this, you know, words change everything. And it's one of the most basic forms of communication we have. So in reading this, and you know, really doing that analysis of it, I, you, can, you can see the in intentionality of words and the connotations that they hold and how they're able to mold a certain message um, and affect people in a certain way. Um, and I think, you know, why do certain texts become canonical? Because they transcend culture with words. They can, the, it's such an effective placement of language that it can go across culture and time and still remain as relevant as it was when it was first written. I don't know why I'm looking at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like I said, so 19th century France, just to set the scene up, um, this is going to be the emergence of the bourgeoisie. Um, so we see the higher class kind of being ruptured, and we see um, the working class, the peasant class, being put under the pressure of the bourgeois, um, and kind of being forced to, to restructure their lives under this new class. Um, so no longer was is agriculture sufficient in supporting themselves. They have to find a trade. They have to um, go into urban centers and so that, you know learn how to make money a different way. Um, and so that's kind of the same predicament that um, the main character Felicite. Um, she's she's in that predicament, and she's going to be the maid servant and who I talk about today. Um, so uh, to begin. Um, so in in my essay, I kind of describe two different scenes. Um, to ruin the ending for you, but it's, it's a big part of this essay. Um, her death, um, so like the, I discussed the scene of her death versus a certain scene where she's being manipulated. And both of those kind of work to demonstrate how trivial her life is in the face of, of the higher class of being subservient. Um, so something that Flaubert does very effectively is he does a lot of structural juxtapositions within the plot. Um, just to make sure that, to isolate Felicity and to make, to make us kind of feel that distance that she feels. Um, and so, you know, towards the end when she is dying, there is a scene where the text is rapidly shifting between this, you know, a church procession and her dying in her bed. Um, and just to kind of outline how this, this church procession was described, um, so the church procession is described as a pyramid of bright colors. Um, Alencon gems gleaming on a bed of moss and a plaque of lapis lazuli. Um, so in reading that, one gets the sense of this grandeur and, and this, um, the 
this superseding nature that the church has, and it's just so important in comparison to Felicity. And in, in a direct contrast of this, Flaubert jumps to the scene of her death and writes, her breath made her sides heave and her whole body trembled. It's very simple language, it's very direct. There's no real um, you know, flourishing language or adjectives to, to describe her. So you know, immediately in reading that, one gets the sense that she is uh, not as important and that her life is not as important. Um, and there's another scene where he kind of does this juxtaposition again is Felicite uh, is kind of created to have a certain naive quality to her. Um, and in that way, by doing that, by molding the words that way, by communicating that to us, um, we can see you know, how that lessens her existence even more. Um, she kind of exists in the context of other people. Um, she doesn't have a narrative of her own. Um, so you know, there's a scene on the beach where there's this family and she wants to help this family. And they're clearly, um, she bought them a blanket, several shirts, and a stove, but um, it was clear that they were bent on getting all they could out of her. Um, it was clear, Flaubert writes, it was clear, to make to us that it was clear that um, they're, they're trying to manipulate her, yet you know, throughout the narrative, Felicity never really understands that, and she gets manipulated and robbed, and like, not actually robbed, but you know, um, fool. Um, so, yes, and um, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, there's this notion of how, how this um, adjectival language can build character, and, and move forward a plot and um, you know while reading it's it's very interesting how how one can take um, an individual character and use it to you know represent a broader scope um, of, of experience so Felicity represents that working class she represents you know that you know those people that are that were stepped on and Flaubert uses this as a very real depiction a very harsh depiction of that time um, which was very contrasting to the literature at the time. Um, you know, realism was just kind of starting to emerge. Um, and it, um, and uh, you know, the, the manipulation of language and the connection between the words and what people take away is something that, that I focused on in this essay. And I wish I had something more structured to tell you all, but that, that is pretty much, that's pretty much the, the synopsis of what I wrote about. Okay. And yes, you really never know what format these. Sometimes there is a table. Up here. <laughs> sometimes it is more kind of conversational, and, and that's part of what these this um, business is like. <laughs> Academic conferences. Uh, so, and by the way, I wanted to let you know that this outfit was Anna Wintour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't find so uh, But no, we actually have much better examples of fashion around here than this. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I was excited about this panel, and I think I, was, I had good reason. It, it turned out that I should have been excited because it's got a lot of great stuff here. It's got a lot of um, um, ideas. First of all, just everybody was just so poised and uh, mm -hmm. articulate. Um, it's just a pleasure to hear your talks. And second of all, you guys are all coming at certain issues from different um, angles, but really um, sort of highlighting, highlighting certain commonalities within them. First of all, you have, for example, and I'm just throwing these out because you might want to talk about them, they might stimulate something. But uh, you know, the idea of the audience and the, the business of, of art and, or business of communication. You know, we were all looking at different um, commodities in a way, right? Fashion is a commodity, it's probably the most obvious one. But also, you know, these prints are commodities and they were bought and sold and they, they responded to fashion as well. And and, and of course, liter literature did too, and uh, they were selling, <laughs> they were selling stories, selling narratives, and you know, what got in those narratives, in turn, influenced what people thought was possible. So that that seems to me something that you can um, take away and think about 
a little bit. And maybe if you didn't, that it, it's not always obvious, you know. So by comparing things, you often see things that you didn't see before. What about just the idea of what people uh, use to represent things? You have photography here with Vogue, chiefly, right? And it's closer to maybe design sometimes. Um, fashion itself is a form of representation. And then you have, um, I'm looking at Amanda, but I'm actually in gesturing towards George. Uh, the, you know, uh, Woodblock prints, really interesting, right? They look really old fashioned, but they're actually very modern. Look at the perspective in some of these, it comes from modern representation. And then, you know, the whole idea of realism that you can use words to depict reality, and you spoke to that at the beginning of your talk, of your talk I thought really well. So does anyone want to talk about any of those connections? How do you see the market um, shaping the way people uh, perceive reality, perceive the world? I have a question that I should have asked it earlier, actually about your presentation before. So in, in all of our, in our panels, um, in mind and in audience, we were talking about art worlds that are, are pioneered by men. Um, these works were made by men, these, these roads were traveled by men, Vogue, if the fashion industry today is still led by men, but in your case, the representation of the lower class, of that of that class that many of us, especially today, so can identify with, um, not only economically, but culturally, um, it was represented by a woman. And I just want to know if you have any thoughts about how, if it was, could, could the effect have been the same had it been portrayed by a man? Or are we truly only able to capture the essence of, of this class, of the struggle and of, of the abuse by, by using women? I mean, I think it's interesting that the author himself is a man trying to represent a woman. Um, I think that's that's an interesting look at, especially for the time period. Um, I think it was an interesting choice as well to make her a female. And I, and I, I think the female perspective, especially in this story, is going to be a little bit more vital to understanding the time period, just because they were put under the most pressure of that changing form of lifestyle. Um, and there wasn't really any agency that she had. And I think, I think it was very specifically because she was a female. And for that reason, choosing her was probably the most effective way to communicate that. I don't know if that answered anything. No, I don't know. Well, I mean, I want to throw a question back to you then, because I mean, I, I walked in to ask you to talk to you, but what about the representation of women in, in woodblock prints? I mean, is that going on at all? And if so, what's being communicated? Prostitution, to, to give you the most honest answer, um, most of the images, and I, I don't think many of them are seen in this room, um, in some cases you'll see a, 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 a image of royalty, um, but even in that case, um, the courtesans, the women of the court, are in many ways used as a higher version of that status. Um, at gay shows, of course, they are not used for that purpose, but the art of entertainment as well. So even in the even in modern day, uh, the appreciation of these prints, you have to acknowledge and recognize that women were not necessarily of a lesser class, but serve that purpose. Of course, Japan is a good example of women reading. A Japanese woman wrote the first novel, <laughs> so of course we can't discredit that. But thank you for saying that. It's, it's hard to find. Well, I have another question for all, all three of you then, um, is in assessing the different media that you hit upon, um, how would you rate the, um, the footballs, magazine, short story, uh, how would you rate the ability of each communication form to present the status quo? and also to challenge the status quo. Is that a project all of your media? Yeah, oh, I just asked that. Um, well, I definitely think, you know, I mean, Vogue for sure, like, creates the status quo, and uh, for models or designers to be featured on Vogue is 
kind of saying, okay, like, you know, well, so you think you finally made it, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's an achievement um, in itself. Um, at the same time, the study um, on Vogue after its introduction to China, one of the things the, uh, the you know, that research um, paper looked at was um, how beauty is perceived, um, you know, through Vogue. And one thing they noticed was, although Vogue is in many markets that are um, like very diverse in different places, um, the most of the covers have still been uh, like white women that, or European women of European ancestry that's been represented. There's only been very few times when um, you know culture was explicitly shown um, on um, you know uh, featured in Vogue, and uh, so I think although they sort of replicate their model of creating that insider channel of communication. Um, the, at the end of the day, it is still very um, West-centric, uh, you know, standards that are being propagated, or, you know, or at the end of the day, what they're, you know, what they're saying is the European or the American fashion is what the rest of the world should aspire to be. And uh, the fact that um, a designer from China is being featured is sort of saying, okay, you're one step closer to getting to that, you know, that standard, um, and and we are approving you more than, you know, we need, you know, your uh, new thought. <laughs>